Good afternoon and welcome. We're so happy to have you here for our Thursday webinar and my state of the U.S. housing market for 2024, kind of a look back at what's happened this year and where we're headed. Uh, I'll, I'll be doing my forecast for 2025 at our upcoming live event. So today is really more of a 2024 overview and wrap up, sort of the state of U.S. housing. So thank you so much for joining me. I'm Kathy Fedke, co-founder of Real Wealth, host of The Real Wealth Show and Real Estate News, and very, very happy that you're with us today. Uh, for our next webinar, you don't want to miss it because it's my hubby, uh, Rich Fetke's Focused Investor Year-End Wrap-Up. This is so powerful. It is an hour that you will not regret because you'll get to look back at the year and see what you've accomplished, what you're proud of, what you could have done better. Uh, when we don't take the time to review, we just can sometimes stagnate. So we get lots of rave reviews on this. We do this as a family always, and uh, it's super powerful. And I'm so excited to announce our upcoming live event in San Francisco, well, South San Francisco, Saturday, January 18th. Oh, we had so many people tell us, please, please do uh, more events. We want to see each other in person. And I agree. I just love seeing our investors and our property teams. So we'll be bringing in 10 different property teams from around the country so you can meet them all, learn about their markets, what's going on find out about their property management. They'll be pre presenting, but they'll also have booths. We'll have um, some kind of social hour afterwards. So it's gonna be great. We'll have a lot of us there. Rich and I will be there. I will be giving, as I said, my forecast for 2025 and Rich will be giving his focused investor presentation, which has also been a big hit over the years. You can register by just uh, doing this uh, QR code. All right, for those of you who don't know much about me, my background is in broadcasting. I graduated from San Francisco State University and brought in the broadcast department, uh, worked at CNN as my first job, then got uh, into the news department at KTVU, Fox News in Oakland when it was just news, no slant. Then um, moved over to ABC and then a small station in San Ramon. And uh, But then when I discovered real estate, uh, you know, the power of real estate and jumped into that, I kind of found myself on the other side of the desk uh, helping interpret the headlines for a lot of the, um, you know, the anchors and so forth. Because knowing what the newsroom is like, like and the insanity, you have to know so much about so many things, but you don't have time to go deep. Uh, sometimes I'd have to write a news story in 15 minutes that was, you know, like a huge story. So uh, it's been fun to be on the other side, being a guest in the news. So one of the um, <clears throat> debates that I did, and the reason why I want to share this is that uh, one of the ways that I interpret the headlines is looking at what I think is coming, not just what has happened. So the, to give an example, I debated Robert Schiller. So many of you have heard this. If you haven't, it was really scary debate on Fox. Robert Schiller is, um, you know, Yale graduate and created the Case Schiller um, Index that's constantly looking at housing. And back in 2012, um, he believed that it was a dangerous time to invest or to buy real estate. And I was to give the other opinion that it was the best time ever. Um, you can see here 2012 is when that interview happened. And you could see that prices went up after that. So I was right. How did I win this when I have a San Francisco State degree against Yale? Uh, if you look at it from a data perspective and you're just looking at the past, all you see is prices falling. So sure, that would be scary. I was looking at it as an investor, like, are you kidding? We're buying prices, we're buying properties for one fourth of what they cost just a few years ago. They used to be this, now they're this, yet the rents have gone up. So cash flow is better than ever. How could you go wrong? You know, how could you go wrong? Get as many as you can. And then sure enough, uh, prices took off. So um, I just wanted to share this to say that I'm looking at headlines from the perspective of an investor, and there's just not enough people in the news doing that. Um, they're either looking at it like they don't understand it, or they're looking at it from a home buyer perspective. So the big question that we have right now is where are interest rates going to be? And when I say that, I'm talking about short-term rates that the Federal Reserve controls. Um, we know that when COVID hit, 
uh, the short-term lending rate uh, was 0.25%, which is a quarter percent. So that means that credit cards were cheap, car loans were cheap, mortgages were cheap. Money was so cheap uh, for years. And then because of that, so many people borrowed and bought and spent and our economy went nuts. Uh, so inflation took off and the Fed had to raise rates in a very, very fast manner, unusually fast in, in an effort to slow down the economy and, and cut inflation. Well, stayed there for a while because really wasn't slowing down the economy. It was still really robust until just this last September when the cut, Fed cut by half a percent. Inflation finally got where they wanted it. Then they cut another quarter percent. And the question is, will they cut again in December? Let's look and see. Um, the Fed's got a dual mandate. They are looking at price stability, meaning is there inflation or deflation? They They want a target of about 2%. But they also want maximum employment, which on this you'll see is a little bit over 4%. So if you if you hit the bullseye there, 2% inflation and a little bit over 4% unemployment, that's what's that's their target. And uh if you have unemployment too low, that can cause inflation too because if employers can't get in a, someone to work for them, they have to raise wages to attract um, employees. So that's why, you know, there needs to be a certain amount of unemployment out there, people wanting to work. Uh, so where we are right now is inflation has definitely come down from the high of almost 9% uh, in 2022. It's come down dramatically. So the rate hikes worked and uh, it's gotten very close, but it's been trending a little bit upwards recently. Nothing to freak out about, and it was expected, but it's not going in the direction the Fed wants, which is 2%. So this is why it's kind of uncertain if the Fed will uh, cut rates again in December or just wait till January. There's pretty much an agreement that, or a belief that they will cut by a quarter percent in December, but just not again for a while. But I'm telling you, and I could very much be wrong, and it really doesn't matter, but I kind of think they won't because the data is not there to support it but we shall see. Um, all right, so that's where we are with inflation. Unemployment creeping up a little uh, to that 4.2% 4 level. So remember I said the bullseye that the Fed wants is 2% and about 4.2%. You could say last month that we were there, that the Fed got to the bullseye, you know, the bullseye really close. I mean, 2.5%, 2%, eh, you know, not a big, huge difference in um and inflation. So the Fed has really kind of achieved what it's trying to do. It's just keeping its eye on that inflation number and not liking that it's been trending up. Just slightly though. All right. So jobless claims have been rising as well, but they're still really low. So this just came out a few days ago today. <laughs> um, U.S. applications for jobless benefits rise to the highest level in two months, but remain relatively low. So this is really what we want to be paying attention to is our, while employment unemployment has been creeping up, it's kind of right where the Fed wants it. But what they don't want is people losing their jobs. So, so far, it's pretty low. And uh, some economists say we don't have to really worry about things until we get close to the 300,000 level. And right now, um, it's just 242,000. So it's it's up from the trend, but nothing to worry about yet. Wage growth is slowing as well. And you'll see headlines on this. Oh my goodness, you know, wage growth is slowing. We're going into a recession. But when you look at this chart, you can see, yes, wage growth really went up in 2022, along with inflation. Remember I said there were so many job openings. Employers had to pay more to attract employees. And uh, and so wages went up. Now, inflation was here. So wages weren't keeping up with inflation, but it was way above where uh, wage growth normally would be. Now, it's slowing down. But what's not often told is it's still above historic levels. So wage growth is still pretty strong. And remember, inflation is now here. So people are earning more than they're having to pay for stuff. So that's good. Uh, now, there's a, been a lot of talk like, oh, yeah, we're in a recession or, you know, people aren't saying it, but we really are. But I want to show you this data is saying we are definitely not in a recession. Uh, this is the GDP, gross domestic product. You'd need this to be negative, um, really to be in a recession, and it is not. In fact, Q4 of this year 
Uh, this final quarter is expected to be maybe as high as 3%. So the economy is ticking along just fine. We are not in a recession, although some people feel like they're in a recession because, like I said, uh, this is wages. You know, wages went up, but it doesn't mean anything if inflation is going up faster. So stuff is still costing more than what you're making. Now, inflation came way down and wages stayed up. So in 2023, it got better. And then inflation really came down and wages stayed elevated. But what people are seeing, if you were not one of those people seeing wage growth, well, then all you're seeing is higher prices. Because when you look at this chart, and this is where a lot of people get confused, they're like, yeah, but inflation's down. Okay, let me describe it this way. Let's say that in 2021, you only gained six pounds. And then in 2022, you only gained nine pounds. And then in 2023, oh my goodness, you really slowed down your weight gain to just four pounds. Uh, by 2024, you know, you could say, I've really got this under control, when in fact, you're still fat, right? You haven't lost weight. You're just not gaining weight as quickly. And that is basically what voters are, um, you know, we're seeing is, especially people on fixed incomes. And we have a lot of seniors on fixed incomes and younger people who are too. So for them, this inflation has been super painful. And that is what some people say is the reason that the election went the way it did. Is this, it's the economy, baby, right? It's the economy, uh, people not feeling wealthy. But it's a tale of two worlds. And this is so important to understand is that there are some people who are doing great, better than ever. And it's the asset holders getting richer every day while people on fixed incomes without assets, not feeling so good because they're just paying more for things when their income's staying the same. So national home equity, if you were a homeowner, you're doing great. You saw an 8% gain, $1.3 trillion year over year change in home equity. And looking at the areas, Californians making a bunch of money over here. You've got, um, you know, Idaho and, I mean, uh, Washington, sorry. A uh, lot of these areas, you know, Texas apparently not so much, but a um, lot of other areas around the country, people feeling wealthy. Uh, one of the reasons for that, and I think I just like to show this slide for people to really see what's behind it, when... COVID happened and there were STEMI checks going out and PP, was PPP loans, what was it? You know, the loans that, you know, employers didn't have to pay back and then super low cost money. So people were borrowing. Uh, the M1 money in circulation just shot up. And then an M2, it's not quite as dramatic, but my goodness, if you just look at this section, the increase in money circulating it was the same amount of circulate, money that was in circulation in, uh, in the mid-2000s that was added to the money supply after COVID. So that kind of created this bifurcated economy where you've got a lot of people who took that money and invested it in stocks and real estate and are making more money. And then other people who maybe didn't have companies, so they didn't get those forgivable loans and they you know, maybe didn't get the stimmy checks or whatever, and uh, they didn't get to benefit. So let's move to housing because that's where a lot of that money landed. Uh, the big question, when will the crash come? Home prices can't continue to rise forever, right? That's uh, what some people have been saying for, I don't know, 15 years or so. So uh, this I just had to pull off the internet because I thought it was so funny. Why the upcoming housing crash will be worse than 2008. This came out a year ago. Um, history repeating itself. Yes, all over again. Goldman Sachs and analysts are sounding. Oh, anyway, you get the idea. Lots of people saying a housing crash coming. Obviously, that did not happen. Some markets were more affected than other, others, but overall, prices have been going up on average. So why? Why have so many um, housing crash people been wrong? Well, they weren't looking at these these slides I'm about to show you. So if you were around during the great, you know, they're doing the mortgage meltdown right before that, 2005, 2006, 2007, you can see quite a large number of subprime borrowers. These are people who have a history of not paying their mortgages. 
or getting more uh, paying any bills. They have bad credit. Uh, getting mortgages. Um, here's people with a little bit better credit, but not great. Also getting a bunch of mortgages. And you fast forward to today, very few subprime and mostly, mostly people with really excellent credit scores. So the people who are borrowers today had to prove that they could pay. And those people are locked into low payments. So again, this is the thing that housing crash people are not seeing, is that there is not distress with homeowners today. Homeowners are strong borrowers with strong FICO scores, and they're locked into historically low payments compared to their income. Remember, their income has gone up, but they're locked into fixed rates. Now, in the mortgage meltdown, those people were in adjustable rates. Most people were in adjustable. So, you know, you compare the two. In 2007, when rates went up, well, people suddenly couldn't make those payments and they defaulted. We don't have that today. Most people are on fixed rate. There's not going to be a change in their payment. They're locked in and they have the lowest housing cost, really, in history or at least in a long time. Plus, when you look at this, 89% of those borrowers have loans under 6% under the rate today, with a majority between this 2 and 3% rate. So they've got these extremely low payments, half of what it would be today, and um, they're staying longer as a result. So you can't have a housing crash when you have a strong homeowner. you got a homeowner with low payments compared to their income with these locked-in mortgages that are not adjustable, they're fixed. And 40% of homeowners have no mortgage at all. They're not going to default on anything except property taxes and maybe insurance, but insurance isn't required. You know, so you, you've you got the largest, second largest generation today, but what used to be the largest in ge generation, the baby boomers who are the youngest are 60 years old. So think about it. The, the whole plan is when you're young, you buy a house in your early 30s and you get a 30-year fixed rate mortgage. And guess what? When you get in your 60s, you paid it off. Well, that's not happening so much today. People aren't living in the same house for 30 years, but people in their 60s, they might be because they bought the house when they were 30. They raised their kids. They're maybe not going to move. They're living, they're staying there and they're debt free. So again, homeowners aren't really the people in distress here. They're swimming in equity. Since 2012, remember that interview I did with, uh, um, yeah, on Fox, look at, 2012, look at the amount of equity that people have. So not only do they have low payments, they're rich. <laughs> They've been paying down their loans, paying them off, yet their values have gone up. And that is why foreclosures are low. You might see headlines saying that foreclosures are on the rise, and they were kind of, but it's flattened out and even declining. Uh, so and still way lower than it's been in a long time. So uh, foreclosures are not a problem. If you have, if you run into issues that would cause foreclosure, you put your house on the market and you sell it and you capture all that equity. All right. So another headline you're going to see is watch out. Inventory levels are up. And it's true. They're up more than 27%, um, up 27% more than last year. So that could be scary if that's the headline you see. But when you look at this graph, you see it's still well below uh, 2018, 2017, um, 2019 levels. Although getting close, the gap is is nearing, which means nobody was freaking out about inventory in 2018 or 2019. We're just going back to a normal market, which is healthy. It's good. You don't want so little inventory that you got 100 people making offers on one property. Not healthy. All right. And anyway, when you look at inventory, the long-term trend is actually down. And this is all happening, low inventory, at a time when this huge demographic, the largest one today of millennials, is at first-time homebuyer age in, the, in their early 30s. So these people who should be and would like to buy a home are coming in at a time when the payment is double what it was just a few years ago and what the current homeowners are experiencing. So if someone has a $3,000 mortgage payment, well, guess what? For someone today, that might be $6,000. That's a big difference. It's really hard. So this poor group um, of people is coming in with super, I mean, they're not super high rates, just higher than they were. 
and high home prices, and it's a tough time. So when you're talking about distress, is it is it the people on the party bus who are locked into low rates and bought a long time ago and have this equity, or is it the people trying to get on the party bus? Obviously, the distress today is here. It's with people trying to buy assets that they keep seeing going up in value. They want to be a part of that, and it's so hard to get in. The good news um, brought to us by Marcus and Millichap is that millennials are growing up, and the oldest are 28, or um, they're 28 to 43, and the older ones are getting into their prime earning years. So that means that if they haven't bought a house yet and they've experienced this wage growth, they may be in a position to do it soon because 6% isn't really, 6.5% isn't really a high interest rate. It's just a sticker shock, right? Because prices have continued to rise as well. As we can see here, um, home prices have just, since 2020, gone up dramatically, along with mortgages, making it very difficult. And then adding to the problem, there's, or what is part of the problem, why prices keep going up is there's just not enough homes for the number of people who would like to have one. So uh, that millennial group is huge, but the part of them, the group that is at a first time home buying age, it's like 15 million and only about 4 million, under 4 million homes have been selling every year. So you don't need that many people to be able to afford a home to be able to wipe out the supply that's out there. And then when you look at this, this supply issue is not going to be fixed anytime soon. He's saying that 18 million homes are needed over the next 10 years from household formations, from teardowns, people taking inventory off the market for a second home, and then just the undersupply already of 1.5. So John Burns, who I trust very much with his data, is saying uh, we have a shortage of of 18 million over the next 10 years. So the problem's not going away. And it's exacerbated by this, the household size declining over the years and single person households increasing, which puts more demand on inventory in addition to immigration, which may or may not be an issue over the next four years. But at least for the last four years, um, there was about three point, so some people say much more than this, but about 3.8 million more people that came in the country that also need a place to live. Now, unlikely that they are buying homes, but probably needing rentals, which is putting some stress on the rental market. Um, so for those who, you know, just are priced out or maybe just look at the numbers and say this doesn't make sense, um, you, you know, they, they might be saying, I could rent a place for $2,400 or I could buy it for $3,500. I think I'm going to rent and save that money or invest it elsewhere. Uh, and so until rates go down a lot, it's going to continue to be cheaper to rent than to own. So if that's the case, then where are all these people going to rent, right? What's out there for them? In addition, you've got uh, this younger generation of Gen Z with 4.3 million per year uh, looking to rent and probably moving into apartments, these young adults. But this group is, is coming into the mix. So, um, you know, where? Where is all this demand? Uh, what we know is there was a lot of migration over the last four years in migration, people moving around to different places. Uh, red would be less than one. So people are leaving. And then uh, you can see the blue is uh, yeah, growth. You can see a lot of people moving to Florida, Carolinas, Idaho, and Texas, not, you know, a lot of people moving and moving out of California, as you saw. Now, I love this slide because it's all about location, right? You want to be in the right market at the right time. Again, this is from John Burns, and he was showing the cycle. Austin's an area that got overbuilt, too many new apartments. Uh, so they've actually seen prices come down and rents come down. Um, in Elab, Salt Lake, I, I can't figure out what happened there, but I, I think a lot of construction slowed down and people left. Uh, San Antonio, they were seeing rents uh, come down, but they, that's turning around. And then San Francisco, we know that city's had a lot of issues. Uh, but bottoming, which means maybe 
recovery is next, these markets could be interesting. And then the markets that are growing, you can see on here some of those same ones you see at Real Wealth, Indianapolis, Jacksonville, uh, good good markets for that have an upside. And here too, Dallas, uh, Tampa, we, we love these markets. All right, so despite public return to office mandates, work from home is still growing by about 5 million per year. Uh, so another important thing to pay attention to. And for those who do need to go back to work, it's maybe not full time, not five days a week. Maybe it's three days a week or two days a week. So instead of buying, if you live or work, if you work in Austin, instead of paying so much to live there and high rents, people are moving to the suburbs and the exurbs, you know, um, that area between San Antonio and Austin is growing very quickly. Same with Orlando. It's gotten expensive, but you don't have to live there. You can live just right outside in Lakeland or Daytona or Cala, Palm Bay. These areas are, have been really growing quickly as a result of Orlando's prices getting so high, people needing to be near work, but still wanting something affordable. Same with Denver. Denver's gotten crazy expensive, but you can live outside a little bit and commute just a couple of days a week and, and live in more affordable places. So when you have this kind of data and you're not just listening to headlines and getting freaked out, but really understanding what's under it, it helps make good decisions. For example, in 2022, I think it was when, when the Fed said that they were going to start a very aggressive rate hike. There were headlines everywhere saying, oh my gosh, a rate hike, that's going to cause a, a housing crash. And I was looking at the data going, why? Because the people who own homes aren't a part of that problem. They're locked into low rates. What it's going to do instead is really lock down the market because nobody's going to want to sell. It's like, why would you think that's going to crash the market? So those were the headlines, but I didn't believe it. Uh, I, I believe too much in supply and demand and not just interest rates. So we opened up the North, North Dallas Rental Fund and went totally against the grain. We went all in when people were running out. And as a result, our team was able to be the only buyer in the room and we could negotiate properties for like 50% discounts. It was insane because there was no competition. And that fund is closed, but those who are in it are really benefiting uh, because we couldn't buy those same properties today. They've gone up so much in value. That's going to be a really successful fund. So that's why this information is so important. So you can make good decisions and kind of go against the grain, go against the crowds. Um, our current syndication that we have still open, uh, but it's filling up really quickly, is our build to rent community with uh, 28 duplexes that we're building there in the fastest growing, with the top 10 fastest growing zip code in the country, fast growing city in the U.S., we plan to build, lease, hold for five to six years, and then sell when, when these prices have gone up. Uh, investors are getting a 12% preferred return plus 50% of the remaining profit. You have to be accredited to invest in this, but it's uh, realwealth.com forward slash wildpine. And like I said, it's going to sell out really quickly. So if you're interested, you might want to look into that. Now, again, the data to support this is, uh, is this slide, the National Build for Rent Trend uh, Outlook. And uh, this was from IMN uh, with the Single Family Rental Conference where you have a lot of build to rent companies there and single family rental funds and so forth. This graph shows recent history and outlook for build to rent starts based upon the data from Census Bureau, but adjusted using data and estimates from the National Association of Home Builders the starts, people starting to the build to rent fund, uh, build to rent communities have fallen because prices have gone up. And that's resulted in a drastic fall off of new completions, meaning that now there's all this pent up demand, but not enough supply. So we're coming in, we're rushing in to, to fill that need. Because look at this pent up demand for build to rent is huge by 2026, which is just perfect timing for us. So we're very excited about this slide. Okay, and anyway, in spite of all of this, I want to go back to the basics and remind people why 
I can't seem to invest in anything else. <laughs> way over, way over invested in real estate, but nothing will convince me that it's better. Um, although, you know, we're diversified a little bit, but I just want to come back to why timing matters and the economy matters, but what matters most is the power of real estate. So you get to borrow money to acquire the asset. Um, you get tax benefits for doing it. The values increase over time. And even though you maybe put 20% down, you get to keep the increase on the whole thing. You get to keep, uh, you get to pass it on to your heirs. You get asset protection and cash flow along the way. And if you don't sell, if you just need access to the money and do a refinance, you can take the cash out and not pay tax on it. And then when you pass away and your children inherit it, it steps up to market value and they don't pay tax. Now, I'm going to give a quick disclaimer here and say, anytime I talk about, uh, you know, taxes, talk to a CPA to, you know, make sure that and confirm what I'm saying or to make sure that this works for you. And also the disclaimer that we can't know the future. We're just, I'm just giving you my reasoning, uh, but don't sue me for it. <laughs> okay. All right. So let's get back to just the power of real estate. So let's say you buy this property. Let's just say it's $100,000. You put $20,000 down. It increases by 5%. The property is now worth $105,000. You put $20,000 in and you made $5,000 in a year. That's a 25% return plus the cash flow. Haven't even included the tax benefits. So that's why people love real estate. And over time, the people renting the property from you are paying down your note for you. So imagine if you bought more than one. Um, a lot of mistakes that people in California make is they'll buy one really expensive property that doesn't cash flow. I'm helping my sister out right now who is um, has got cancer coming back. And so we're renting a house for her near um, her church and near the hospital. And I looked it up. The house is worth like three or four million dollars. And the rent is $5,000. Now, $5,000 is a really expensive rent, normal for California, but that's not a great return if you're the landlord, right? A $3 million house, you should be making a lot more. So that's a mistake that a lot of Californians make. And if your tenant runs into trouble or you have to evict them and it takes a long time in California, of course, you are 100% out of money if you have one property that's expensive like that and one tenant. But what if you exchange that property, you sold it, now you have $3 million to reinvest somewhere else, let's say 10 different properties diversified around the country so that if one part of the country is experiencing a challenge, you got properties in another part. And even if 50% of your portfolio went vacant, you're making more money than that one property in California. So this is kind of what we've been doing and teaching for years, especially with Californians who have uh, such opportunities to 1031 into better deals. Uh, so taking you back to 2005, when I first started the Real Wealth Show, and I had Rich Dad Poor Dad on, um, uh, Robert Kiyosaki, this is when he really gave me the foundational information I use to this day. Um, 2005, he told me he was selling all of his California, Arizona, uh, Nevada, and Florida properties because he knew that those areas had done a lot of the liar loans. They were where most people were buying, but they were buying with bad loans that were going to adjust and it was going to be crazy. So I was going to use a different word, but um, so he said he was going to sell all of that in 1031 to buy in Texas. And I asked him why he said, well, Texas, this was again, 2005. He said, that's where the highest job growth is projected, the highest population growth, yet it's still affordable. So the people who live there can still afford to live there and rent from you. And yet with so much influx of people coming, they can't possibly keep up with, with growth, even in Texas, where it's a lot easier to get stuff done. So he said, I just can weather the storm there, that the coming storm. So he could see the storm coming. He knew there was going to be a major housing crash. But he also knew how to sort of get out of the way of it and uh, park his his assets in, um, in Dallas. So that's what I learned is if you invest in areas with job growth, population growth, infrastructure growth, and affordability, you're kind of protecting yourself from any storm. Uh, because 
when all that's happening, it's really hard to bring on enough housing to keep up. So again, that's why Rich and I bought a bunch of properties in 2005. Uh, this was a $140,000 property. I mean, we, we bought a bunch of them. They ranged between 125 and 145,000 rented for over 1500 gorgeous, brand new A-class properties, A-class schools. I talked about it on the real wealth show. And this lady called me and said, you sound so excited about real estate. And I was too. And I thought it would be my retirement plan. And instead, all it's doing is draining me. I bought three houses in Stockton. And all I do is feed them. They're either vacant or I'm doing an eviction or there's a repair that's needed. And all I'm doing is paying for these properties. They're not paying me. Uh, and I asked her the numbers and she's like, yeah, they're about worth about $400,000 and I get rent for about 1200 if I'm lucky. I was like, girl, let me help you sell these. And let me help you exchange into nine new properties like I just showed you that are going to need no maintenance um, and are a third of the price, fourth of the price. Well, they also rented for more than 1200 She quintupled, I put quadruple together, but she she made so much cash flow overnight with, you know, within that six months of doing the exchange, she was able to give her resignation letter to her boss, quit her job, retire, because now she understood how to make real estate work. Because it can definitely be a drain. Let me tell you, you could lose money in real estate 100% if you buy an old property in an area that's not so great, which is what so many people do when they get started. They're like, oh, I'm going to get the cheapest property. And it's in a bad neighborhood and it needs all this work. And um, let me tell you, you're going to hate real estate like she did, and unless you do it right. And so we bought her these nine properties near Rockwall, as I said, all under 150000 Those properties are well over four or $500,000 today. So she took that million-dollar portfolio, and it's five or six million today, plus the tenants have paid down her mortgage. So that is wealth. And we did it in this area because we knew that there was infrastructure coming in, making this area more desirable because the commute to Dallas would be um, 20 to 30 minutes versus an hour. You can see um, she sold her Stockton properties at the peak. The person who bought them had just paid $400,000 for these junk properties that were then worth $75,000. So like I said, you can lose money. If that person held the properties, it took 15 years to get them back to the price they paid. Whereas Texas is where she this is the time that she 1031'd. It stayed flat for a while, which is fine. She was able to keep it rented. But look what happened in 2012. All right. So I talked about that on the Real Wealth Show. That's when uh, we realized a lot of people needed help and wanted um, referrals to teams nationwide that could make it a turnkey process to find properties out of state, have them well managed, have them in good condition so you don't have to deal with all these repairs. And uh, that's how we formed Real Wealth. And that's what we're doing today. As you know, these are some of the markets that we're still really excited about. Now, there's other really good markets out there, but there's a combination where you need a really good team in a really good market. So, you know, that's, that's a challenge. But uh, you know, again, this is a more current list of the places that we're in where we have the double whammy, great markets with great teams, areas with job growth, population growth, affordability, healthy rent to value ratios, and landlord friendly. But you might be asking, what about now? How can I make this work now? It's easy for you to say you got in years ago. I'm telling you, Rich and I, are we're so mad. We did a tour to San Antonio, brought a bunch of people we're like, ooh, we want to buy in this neighborhood. And I just called Leah, uh, our director of Real Wealth Realty. I'm like, are there any homes left in that neighborhood? She's like, are you kidding? They sold out on the tour. So um, we're still, I mean, people are buying. It's still possible because on that particular tour, the builder was buying down the, the rate to 3%, making the numbers work. I want to also show this because it's so important. A lot of people are mad at Blackstone and institutional investors buying all the inventory and Usually this slide shuts them up. It's like, no, they really don't own much of the housing stock. Don't you worry about the institutional investors. They're not taking all the homes. All right. And just again, to give you an idea, this property in Anderson, Indianapolis is $176,000. This one's already sold, but I just want to show you what our investors are buying and what's out there so you can realize there's still deals out there. 
Um, $176,000 property that rents for $1,300. Okay, if 10 years ago it might have rented for uh, $1,700, but those days are gone. You could still make these numbers work. Uh, here's a, a house in, um, in Georgia, purchase price $240, monthly rental income $1,700. Numbers still work, especially if you could buy down that rate. Like this San Antonio prop property for a duplex, six hundred forty-nine thousand for a brand new duplex in the fastest growing city in the country, with estimated rent of forty-four hundred. Remember, I said that the California landlord of my sister has a three million dollar property making five thousand in rent. <laughs> uh, so this is a better deal, and uh, and the uh, team in San Antonio is willing instead of discounting. or giving upgrades like most builders do, we ask them to put that money towards buying down the rate to 4%, in some cases even less. Now, unfortunately, this Bernie one is totally sold out. I missed out too, but lots of opportunity. All right, so if I wrote this book, Retire Rich with Rentals, to really help people who are new at investing have a checklist. We also have a checklist at, at Real Wealth. You can ask one of the investment counselors to show you where that is. And of course, my Real Wealth Show, doing that to inspire you, uh, to remind you that, what was that first slide? I, it was something trillion dollars in, uh, in equity growth over this past year. You want to be on the party bus, You're not trying to get on the party bus. And then the real estate news, just keeping everybody informed. So again, here is, uh, you know, that live event. We're going to have the teams come out. You can meet them, not have to fly across the country. Then when you decide who you, who you really like and want to work with, then you can fly out and go on one of the tours. So we hope we get to see you at our Wealth Expo. And now I think I can take questions. Okay. You made it go up. I don't know what that means. <laughs> I, I guess I personally made it go up. I'm not sure. Okay, please comment on the meaning of Warren Buffett's huge cash position. I need more info on that. What's a fair number of properties we can acquire with a $500,000 1031? Well, that depends on what you're trying to achieve. Uh, I mean, you know, if you're buying a $200,000 property and you have to put $40,000 down, then you could you could buy quite a few. Uh, if you're wanting to just buy a duplex and keep it simple, you could get a very low loan. Depends on the loan that you have on there um, and what you're trying to do. Is this for the long term? Are you looking for really something that's going to perform over the next 10 or 20 years? Are you looking for cash flow today? Uh, if, if so, Ohio, Indianapolis, or um, Birmingham, there's, those are going to be your cash flow markets and your growth markets are going to be Texas. Florida, they're going to be more expensive, but that we just keep seeing continued growth there. Uh, but that is what our investment counselors are for, is to help walk you through a 1031. We specialize in 1031s. It's really what we're famous for because when you sell a property and you've got a 500 or a million or a $2 million exchange, it's really intimidating. Like, how are you going to fulfill that in, in 45 days? And that's what we do. We, we are like on it. Okay. We get in touch with all of our teams, who's got property that's really going to meet this timeline and this this uh, investor's goals, and uh, we can line it up for you pretty quickly. So uh, that's what our investment counselors do, and they help you. And the way that Real Wealth gets paid is, uh, is through broker-to-broker -broker fees. The broker on the other side pays us a referral fee, so uh, you're not even having to pay for our service. Is the expo available virtually? We were talking about it, but um, at this time, we don't have that in, uh, planned. So, but we do weekly webinars. I will be doing at some point my housing forecast. So you'll get to hear that. And we'll just make sure you have the information because the expo is really nice to be together in person. But if you just can't make it, we'll make sure you have the information you need. As a 13-year-old, what should I do for real estate? Look at you. I love it. I love it. I have actually met 13-year-olds who own real estate. Uh, so um, I've, I've seen some people. I had somebody on my show who was buying land. He got into the land business and saved all of his Christmas money and birthday money and bought like a $2,000 piece of land and 
sold it for five thousand dollars you know so there's ways to to kind of get in that way and learn a niche and get good at it um you can borrow from your parents maybe and uh you know you find a deal and say hey mom and dad i'll give you a six percent return if you give me the down payment and go over the numbers with them or grandma grandpa aunts and uncles you know if there's something in it for them um they might be your private lender So lots of ways to get in, uh, you know, work that, I don't know if you can work at 13, but if you can, you know, save your money, save your money. A lot of people don't realize that you can use your education as your two-year um, uh, uh, job history. Like my daughter did, she went to school, graduated with a marketing degree, got a job in marketing, had only been working for about six months, maybe a year. And uh, the bank included the time that she studied as part of her two-year history, and I was able to get a loan. Okay, the Charlotte market has higher vacancy now. Do you still like it? Um, you know, I think that whole North Carolina area is growing, growing, growing. I would need to talk to our investment counselors who are really more boots on the ground. They would be able to... tell you if that's happening in the neighborhoods where we're investing. Because a lot of times you'll you'll hear like Charlotte or Dallas, and we're seeing rents go down, but we're not investing in Charlotte or in Dallas. We're investing in the suburbs, in the path of progress, where people are moving, where businesses are moving. So a lot of times the national news you hear does not apply to the markets that we're in. What is your view on cash flow versus appreciation? Uh, it depends on where you are in life. If I won the lottery and got $10 million or my book took off and I made a bunch of money, I had a big chunk of money, I might invest it for cash flow, right? If I had, let's just say $5 million and I invested it for cash flow, I'm going to have a pretty good return. But if you have $100,000, you know, and you're trying to grow your portfolio, I personally think getting into an area where you have enough cash flow and you're young, let's say you're young and you have time on your side, you can work, you can bring in cash flow from your job. You know, nobody should be retiring at 30. You're here to do something. You've got a purpose. You're here to make a difference in the world somehow. So let your day job be your cash flow when you're young and know that at some time you're going to retire and you're going to need to replace that income. And if that's your goal. You want to be, in my opinion, investing in appreciation markets where the rents cover all the expenses so that in 10, 20, 30 years, you have a retirement portfolio. Uh, but if you already have that chunk of money, got a bunch of money in retirement, or you sell some stock options, or you sell your business or whatever, you might want to go into more cash flow properties because you already got the money. You don't need the appreciation. You just want steady income. Uh, is today a good time to invest in rentals? I hope that my slides showed you that the demand for rentals is massive. You've got millions of people who would love to be homeowners, but there's, it simply doesn't make sense today for a lot of people. Whereas investors, you know, they do have the means, they do have the negotiation skills to be able to either buy down the rate or make the numbers work. So that's why at Real Wealth, we've had a busy, busy year. Like I said, Our investors on our tour bought all the properties, didn't leave me one. <laughs> Very sad about that. So yeah, a lot of people think it's still a good time to invest. And you, you see a lot of hedge funds putting money aside to invest in real estate. All right, is Dallas still a good market? North Dallas, we love North Dallas. Um, Dallas itself is where you're seeing a lot of the change because a lot of new inventory, new apartments came into Dallas proper. But those same apartments weren't being built in, you know, more North Dallas and where our fund is in the Sherman area. I mean, we're just seeing so much growth. So, yes, Dallas is hot. I think it was, I think we just had a meeting today and I'm pretty sure it was the number one market where people within real wealth are investing. It, it kind of fluctuates Dal between Dallas, San Antonio, Cleveland. Jacksonville, Indianapolis, Charlotte. I mean, just cut it, but Dallas was definitely number one. In addition to the markets you're currently investing into, what other cities 
you and your team will like in planning for new investments? That's a good question. I know that our team is looking at uh, lots of different areas. Chattanooga is one of our newer teams. People are loving that market. We have a new market, a new team in Birmingham, but they also have properties in other markets like Huntsville. Um, I'm not sure what other markets they're looking at, but they are researching them. They have a very long checklist when they research and it takes some time and we will definitely let you know as soon as we've got that button down. Pros and cons of owning overseas. Well, I lost a lot of money in Nicaragua. Um, there's this waterfront property, but it was Nicaragua. So uh, they're kind of their whole government went into chaos right after we bought and we were afraid to go, <laughs> never got built. So you have to be careful. Uh, my daughter opened up a company called Gateway Investors because she loves to travel and decided to make it her vocation as well. And she is selling properties in Spain and Portugal. And those two markets have been very, very hot for investors because it's like California weather and beaches and amazing, but like a tenth of the price, like so cheap. So um, again, it depends on the market. Rich and I just bought in Tulum and we think that's going to do really well um, through my daughter, Gateway Investors. Uh, but, you know, you just, it's more complicated, right? It's its not, in in America, if you're American, you get incredible financing that you're not going to probably get elsewhere. Although they do have good financing in Spain and Portugal. Uh, I have 90 to 120,000. I want to invest in property. Where should a first time investor be looking at, looking for a hybrid market? I just don't think you can go wrong in Dallas uh san antonio might be out of your price range um jacksonville might be there might be some properties in florida that fit your budget um indianapolis and ohio for sure would but it's not going to be such a growth market indianapolis has been actually a pretty good growth market so i would talk to an investment counselor at real wealth because they really have their finger on the pulse of, of um, you know, where the best deals are because they're talking to investors every day. Brenda, thanks. Kathy joined late, hoping to catch you tonight at OC RIA. Yeah, thank you. I'll be there. <laughs> Who manages the property managers? Well, you should. <laughs> you know, when we do our initial vetting at Real Wealth, we, we ask a lot of questions, but the problem is people change. It's people industry. So we have seen good companies go bad. So it's really up to the investors. We look at real wealth as almost like a fancy real estate Yelp in the sense that we rely on investor feedback to determine which teams are are great. You know, if we're having rave reviews from, say, our Ohio team or our Dallas team or San Antonio, um, then when someone calls and says, where should I invest? It's like, well, people are raving about this. But then if people aren't telling us that they're having some issues, how could we know and how could we warn you? So um, it's really you as the investor keeping the uh, dialogue open. So you need to be paying attention. Are you getting paid on time? Are you um, understanding your statements? Um, you know, are, are they getting late on payout? Like, are you seeing evictions? The sooner we can know these things and kind of keep track and we start hearing it from a few people, then we can kind of follow up with the property manager and see what's going on. How do you balance leverage risk with mortgage pay down? <laughs> Sorry. <coughs> um, how do you balance leverage? How, how do you basically borrowing money with paying down? Is it dependent on your age, stage of life or market conditions? So that's a good question. I think what you're saying is like some people will put a huge down payment down to try to stay, stay safe and keep the uh, payment low. Um, other people will leverage to the hilt, put as little money down as possible or refinance, take all the cash out and go buy. They just want to be leveraged to the hilt because they want to buy as much real estate as they can. So that really is a risk tolerance thing. I would say certainly when you're young, your job is to build a portfolio. So you want to leverage to the max 
while having plenty of reserves on hand and uh, making sure that the properties are good properties that'll stay rented. Um, you know, that's, that's the key. So I have always been a more risk tolerant person. I, I, I leverage to the hilt whenever I can, but now that I'm a little older, I'm not as interested in that. So uh, now we're more interested in kind of paying stuff down. Uh, one of the business plans that we would share people is if you can get to a 10 property portfolio and then take all of the cash flow from all 10 properties and pay down one property, you know, you can almost pay that property down in a couple of years. And now you have more cash flow and you take all that cash flow and you put it towards paying down the second property. You can do that in a couple of years. We've had a few people do this and within 12 to, you know, about 12 years, they had their whole portfolio paid off. Uh, other people don't want to do that because it's like, oh my gosh, it's equity sitting there. I want to reinvest it. So again, it really is up to you. Which markets are you doing short-term or mid-term rentals? Uh, I would have to ask our investment counselors. We were doing them in Jacksonville. I don't know if they still are. Yeah, you can really do it with any of the properties. Just kind of talk to, uh, you know, talk to the team and see their thoughts on it. What are your thoughts about renting where I live, but also buying rental properties elsewhere? A uh, very, very good question for people who live in high priced markets where it makes just no sense. Like I sh showed you on that slide, it's so much cheaper to rent than to own in, in certain markets where you might pay, like I said, my sister paying $5,000 to rent a three or $4 million property. What would that cost her to own? I mean, it would be ridiculous. So Instead of paying fifteen to twenty thousand dollars if you were going to buy that house, rent it for five thousand, take the difference, and go buy rental property. You know the down payment on that house would be you know at six hundred thousand dollars. Imagine what you could buy in rental property. So uh, I'm a big fan of renting, so you can live wherever you want, and taking that money and investing, so you're still building your portfolio, but getting even better um, tax deductions from the rental properties. But, you know, some people want to own their own home. It gives peace of mind. You know, you don't have to move. Your kids are secure. They get to stay in the same, you know. So, again, it depends on your personal circumstances. How can I get in touch with your team for a possible large 1031? Uh, super easy, realwealth.com. We've got three just fabulous uh, investment counselors who have done 1031s. Our investment counselors are not... 18 year olds who've never bought a property. These are experienced investors who've bought through us. They have bought on their own outside of our network, super sophisticated. They've done different kinds of deals in 1031s and they know these markets way better than I do at this point because they're talking to investors every day. So when you go to realwealth.com, you will be able to connect with one of our investment counselors. And this is really what they specialize in is the 1031. It's what we're known for. Are you making the slides from this presentation available to Real Wealth members? I was planning on it. Uh, so if you registered for this, they'll probably send you a link to the replay. What are your thoughts on the Southwest Florida market? Naples, we're seeing a huge increase in listings, days on market, but average sales price aren't coming down. Defies logic. Yeah, I know. I don't get that. Uh, we like to, we really like to buy in Florida. Uh, we really like to buy in parts of Florida that are out of flood zones, uh, you know, not as risky when it comes to hurricanes and um, new. I really like buying new properties in Florida because the insurance rates are so low and the property taxes are low. So I would definitely talk to our Florida teams and just kind of compare numbers because Southwest Florida, I, I agree. It's just it's like so expensive. Yikes. You can buy cheaper there. Do you have any opinion or a good property manager in the Orlando area? We have a duplex there with rents and vacancy not doing as well as the past. Um, you know, talk to one of our investment counselors and they can give you uh, some information on property managers that have come re recommended by our members. Is single family better than duplex for investment? Just depends what you're looking for. Uh, single family is really nice in terms of getting out of it. Like if you want to sell it, a homeowner would be so happy to buy it, right? Um, if it's a good property, would a homeowner be as excited about buying a duplex? Maybe 
I mean, people are more savvy today than they have been in the past. They have YouTube education. <laughs> they know, hey, I could buy this duplex and put my mom on the other side, or I could rent out half of it and live in the other half. So I don't know that it matters, but historically, single family uh, would go up faster in appreciation, but I don't even know if that's true anymore. That used to be how it is. So they're really up to you, but duplexes tend to bring in more money, cash flow wise. Okay. Is Jacksonville a good market? The properties have gone up significantly and price and cash flow is barely positive. Isn't that the truth? Jacksonville used to be one of our cash flow markets. <laughs> so did Dallas. Now it's not anymore. Um, you know, cash flow is enough, but everywhere's gotten more expensive. Jacksonville was our cheap little market. It isn't. Um, so the good news is people who bought in Jacksonville a while ago, well, they're, they're sitting on a lot of equity. Um, I don't think Jacksonville growth has, is going to slow. Uh, it's just a really, it's a hot market, but our, I would talk to our team there because they might be able to find you something. It's not going to cash flow a ton, but if you're growing, if you're buying in a growth market, at least for me, it's not, you're not doing it for cash flow. You know, you're doing it for future growth. So if you can cover the costs and know that you're well situated with this property, um, with an area that's growing, you're going to do very well in the long run. Just depends. What do you think of Delaware? I don't know it well enough. Sorry. Are there opportunities in towns in the state? I'm not sure what that means. Do you have an invest next opportunities for non-accredited? Okay. Do we have syndications for non-accredited? We're talking about maybe the next one being um, allowing a few non-accredited. So stay tuned. But our current one is filed as a 506C and is accredited only. I'm sorry for that. I have two properties that I own free and clear. Would it be better to 1031 for refinance properties for Texas? You know, it depends on your what you're trying to do. If you own a property free and clear, you're sitting on a lot of equity that could be used. I mean, based on the spreadsheets that we've seen, if you exchanged, if you sold those and exchanged into properties getting financing, you would increase your cash flow and your future equity because you have more assets. Um, you'd have to really, you'd have to probably get financing. So if you don't want to get financing, then you just have to compare the numbers. But if you did want to get financing, you could really increase your portfolio. Will you be adding Tennessee to the locations? We, I don't know. I think they're looking at it uh, and we will keep you posted. I live in California, have $400,000 cash to invest, but need primary residence as well. I'm renting. How should I prioritize buying a primary versus investing? I would just really, like I said, look at rent versus own. Because if it's, if you can rent this, the house in, in uh, California for a fourth of what it would cost you to own, does it make sense? You know, if you're going to stay there forever, maybe if you just want the stability of a home, maybe. But imagine if you took that $400,000, what you could buy. You could buy a lot of property that's rental property and, you know, build your portfolio that way, get massive tax deductions that way, and just rent your primary and get a really nice house. So at $400,000, you're not going to get much in California, right? You might not even get the house you want, but you could rent the house you want and buy a bunch of really great performing real estate. So um, on the flip side, if you can get, you know, if you don't care where you live and you could do like a 3% loan on your primary, um, and again, depends on where you live in California, Chico, California, you could probably get a decent house, you know, San Francisco, it's going to be expensive. So I would rent. You know, if I were in the San Francisco Bay Area, I'd probably rent unless I was planning on staying there for 30 years, then I'd probably buy. But keep in mind that most people don't have earthquake insurance. So there's risk that comes to investing in California. Insurance is high. There's fire hazard. I'm in Malibu. I was evacuated the last few days. Our house is still standing and I'm back home, but we pay for it, man. You know, insurance is high. So you can live much cheaper in California by renting and uh, investing elsewhere. How do you view Bitcoin as an alternative or complement to real estate investing? 
I look at Bitcoin as a gamble and it's fun, rich bought a little bit and it's like, wow, I wish we bought more, but how could you know? Uh, yeah, we made a lot of money on Bitcoin just kind of by accident. So for me, it was just fun to have a little, see where it goes. Uh, but I think it's volatile. Do you help? Uh, I, real estate to me is the better deal, right? Because you can leverage it. Uh, you get cash flow from it. You get tax deductions from it. All the reasons I, I, I just, nothing compares to real estate, in my opinion. Although, if I put a million dollars in Bitcoin, I'd probably be telling you a different story. <laughs> All right. I don't think we only put five, 5,000. Okay. Do you help in, did, do you help in selling a property in one city and then buying another using a 1031? Uh, we do not, we're not the listing broker, so we, we wouldn't necessarily help you sell, but we definitely help you exchange into the, into the property that you would want to get in. Um, so we can help you find the replacement properties for your 1031. Is it better to have one free and clear property cash flowing $2,500 or 10 properties cash flowing $250 each? Uh, we have, one of our loan brokers ran these numbers and we've ran the numbers. Um, you will become much more wealthy, most likely with the 10 properties because uh, just a few things you've got. First of all, you've got one property that, um, what if it's vacant? What if you have issues with it? What if the area, what if something happens to the area? It's like I said, then you're 100% vacant. Whereas if you have 10 properties and 50% are vacant, you're still making more money than if you had the one. And, um, and then you're, you've got 10 people paying down your note, right? So you've got a, if you, let's say you have one $100,000 properties or 10 $100,000 properties, now you have a million dollar portfolio versus a $100,000 portfolio. And if you just look at it from simple math after 30 years, which one's going to be worth more? Obviously the million dollar one versus the, you know, it just depends on what you're trying to do. If you want the cash flow today, it doesn't really make a difference, right? You're probably going to make more cash flow having more properties because you have more chance of them being rented. You also have more chance of having repairs. So you have to make sure you're buying the right properties that aren't going to be nickel and diming you. So I think most of us would agree, get the portfolio. <laughs> um, can you change your investment counselor? Yeah, absolutely. Yep. Just send an email. Uh, I'm not sure where. Maybe hello at realwealth.com. If you don't want to send it to your investment counselor, we'll get it. <laughs> Have you considered establishing a debt fund for those investors who no longer are looking to add to their real estate portfolio, but they want consistent cash flow? We have. Yeah, we're looking at it. Looking at uh, for those people who just, you know, maybe you don't want to be landlords anymore. They just want a good return. Or for a lot of our members, you know, they've been with us forever. And uh, some people, a lot of people have been selling their businesses. They got a big chunk of money and they just, you know, just want something simple. So we get it. Yeah, we're, we're looking at all kinds of fun things. And we've got Paul now on board who we're just really excited about uh, for our syndication department. He's got lots of great ideas for bringing more projects. All right, do you have any thoughts about markets near Northwest Arkansas? You know, we're, we're looking at it. Northwest, uh, Northwest Arkansas has gotten kind of hot. So we would like to definitely look further into it. And I know that our team has been. Okay, somehow I got through the questions and those were all so great. Thank you, everyone. Um, just a quick update. Yep, I am in Malibu and the fire was outside our window and I evacuated, but my hubby stayed and all the guys, all the husbands in the neighborhood stayed and they used our house as the watch house because the fire was outside our door. And at the very last minute, uh, we were just bombarded with airplanes and helicopters and, you know, the airplanes dumping the pink Retard, you know, fire retardant, and then helicopters dumping water, and then firefighters all on our property, and our house was saved. So I uh, got lots of support, and I snuck back in last night. Apparently, you can't get back up here, but I snuck back in late last night and, <laughs> and back home, and uh, all is well. It doesn't even smell like smoke. It's crazy. Yeah. Yep. Fire country. 
And what's interesting is we sit in a dilemma here because we can't actually get enough insurance on our house um, to cover it. it just, we just got canceled. So we have a little bit, but not enough to cover it being rebuilt. So my husband, Rich, is like, I'm staying and I'm going to protect our home. And anyway, I'm glad he, <laughs> I'm glad it was the firefighters who did it and not him. But he had the hoses ready. All right. The price we pay to live in California, but somehow we just can't leave. All right. Probably should be renting, right? I should be taking my own advice. Well, have a wonderful rest of your day. Love your questions. Keep sending them. We will send you a follow-up with this recording. Uh, our investment counselors are standing by ready for you. Uh, they just love, they just love helping people build their portfolios. It's they're passionate about it. They get so excited. And we're in the process of hiring a new investment counselor who's really awesome too. So excited to introduce you. So thanks again. We really appreciate you and we'll talk soon. Bye-bye.